Welcome to Rehash, a Web3 podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rehash, a Web3 podcast. I'm your host, Diana Chen. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about Dow House, Moloch DAOs, and Dow building in general with Spencer Graham, a product contributor at Dow House, and uh, a bunch of other DAOs as well. So I'm really excited to have Spencer here today to tap his brain about all of his DAO knowledge. Welcome, Spencer. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks, Dana. I'm excited to, to be here too, and I'm looking forward to our, our conversation. It's going to be great. So for people who aren't familiar with you, can you start off just by telling people a little bit more about your background, what you were doing before crypto and how you learned about crypto and got into the space uh, in the first place? Yeah, so I've always been interested in in technology. I kind of had a my academic background in you know the mix or overlap between economics and and psychology, and that kind of put me into into sort of a marketing ish kind of kind of space. And ultimately, I found my way um, to like more of a technology forward kind of thing in in product management. And I had been kind of following uh, Bitcoin for a little bit, and then Ethereum for a little bit. And was kind of like marginally interested, but then it was in one of my product management roles at a healthcare company that I really started to see with more clarity the problems that exist in, for example, the healthcare industry in the United States and how what would come to be known as Web3 technologies and Web3 ecosystem in general are uniquely positioned to directly address those core problems and the structural issues at play. So that launched me pretty much headfirst down the the Ethereum blockchain crypto web three rabbit hole. And uh, I started playing around with lots of stuff. Um, it wasn't until a little bit later in, it's actually East Denver 2020 when I first started to really get my hands dirty and and build some things and and do some stuff with other people that I got fully, fully sucked in outside of just my my own time and started spending more of my employer's time doing <laughs> doing some side projects and then got further further sucked in and, and quit that that job and have been full time ever since so that's that's the short version <laughs> it sounds like east denver 2020 was a pivotal moment for a lot of people the the episode after yours that we're going to air is with Ksenia and niche from metagamma delta dow and they also MGD launched at East Denver 2020, and they're uh, uh, they use Dow House, so it's all very intertwined together. It sounds like a lot happened at East Denver 2020. Well, even even more intertwined than you might even think, because I met Ksenia at East Denver 2020, and we actually hacked together on a project called Save Die, and it was through Ksenia that I met a few other other people and have been working with her off and on for for a couple of years now. Wow, I did not. That is a lot more intertwined than I even imagined. <laughs> You're right. Um, but before we dive into all of that stuff, there's something I want to get out of the way. And that is your love for burritos. Uh, I, I'm a little taken aback, to be honest, that you didn't talk about burritos in your introduction of yourself. But burritos are something that you're super passionate about. Can you tell people a little bit about this uh, burrito obsession and why you love burritos so much? Yeah, so it it has like become a little bit of a part of of my identity, at least the one I have you know, chosen to put together. I guess what I didn't mention in in my introduction is that I was born and raised in San Francisco, and mission style burritos in San Francisco are something of a thing, and they're delicious and amazing and, and excellent. And I I grew up going to a couple places, but mostly one, which was called La Taqueria in in the Mission in in, in San Francisco, and in, in like more recent years that particular place has received a lot of notoriety. I think 538 did a whole burrito bracket and that ended up winning like the national championship of burritos in, in the country, which was pretty funny because that's just like the place I grew up going to. But it, it definitely has some opinions about how to put together a burrito. And I have essentially adopted those as my own opinions, my own perspective on on that. The really funny thing is I didn't used to ever get meat in my burritos, but now... I definitely, definitely get meat in my burritos. Okay, we're going to need a little more from that. So what is the proper way to construct a burrito? Can you so, explain it or yeah. demonstrate if you've got ingredients for our viewers on YouTube? I, I did not uh, 
have a chance to, to put together some, some visual aids, but I will try with some, some words. The number one thing for me is that a good burrito, and this is aspirational, I think it's hard to do, but the, the closer to it you can to that you can get, the better. A, an ideal burrito, every single bite has a little bit of every single ingredient. I think a lot of times you see you go to a burrito place and they're just like plopping things down in this big mountain and then they like squash it together. And the result is that you get different pockets of things. And sometimes that's kind of good, like, oh yeah, that's a pocket of cheese or that's a pocket of of avocado or or whatever. But ideally they're all mixed together in, in some way. So what I recommend or what I like to see is ingredients placed in a line on, on the tortilla so that when you roll it up, uh, the cross section has a little bit of everything in it. Another great thing that I learned from La Taqueria is that one, a, a really great way to do the cheese is to have a, instead of like shredded cheese, you can have a slice or maybe two slices of cheese that are maybe like that, that kind of size. And when you go to steam the tortilla, like lots of burrito places do, you first put the cheese on the tortilla and you steam it with the cheese so it gets a little bit melty. And then you basically that's your first layer. And then you can kind of line everything up on top of that. Fascinating. I, I do agree with everything you're saying. I think it makes sense. Um, and I feel like the reason, maybe the reason people don't do that is it just requires more effort. So what we're eating mostly is just low effort burritos. <laughs> you could say that, yeah. Yeah. So in, in many ways, actually listening to you describe how to construct a burrito properly, it kind of reminds me of how to build a DAO, which you've done a lot of since you've been in the space. Do you see similarities between constructing a burrito and building out a DAO? I, I think so. I, I might this my response might be a little bit of uh, torturing the metaphor, but I can certainly try. I think the idea that you want to have sort of equal equal power uh, across all of the ingredients, have them all be included, definitely has parallels to to good DAO or good community construction or facilitation. The a, a good DAO has a wide distribution of power. Uh, and doesn't concentrate it in pockets of cheese or in just a couple people. Uh, so I, I think that that's a pretty good one. Oh, another another thing about burritos that I think is important is there's something special that I like about the juxtaposition of the hot ingredients like the cheese or the beans or the meat or or that kind of thing and the colder ingredients like sour cream and, and avocado or guacamole or, or salsa. Having those two, like the hot and cold together, is is really great. So a wide diversity of of ingredients, wide diversity of different uh, different temperatures, great for a burrito, also great for for a dough. Right. So something you didn't mention in your construction of a burrito is what ingredients need to go in there. And you mentioned that you used to eat burritos without meat. Now you eat them with meat. And so I think just like you know, burritos and dows are similar in the sense that there are many different types of burritos, just like there are many different types of dows. And, you know, you can't say that uh, every burrito has to have exactly these ingredients, like the ingredients can differ, but you sort of just laid out the proper way of constructing it. So when you think about dows, what are some general guiding principles that you think all dows should follow in order to be successful? So there's a couple really important things that, to me, are the defining features of of DAOs. As you're suggesting, there's this DAOs are a huge, massive, wide open design space, much bigger than any type of organization or organizational structure that we've ever had before, and that's super super cool. Uh, but I think the thing that enables that wide open design space are a couple really key like tentpole properties, and one of those is that the power to so so DAOs, one of the things they do is they govern assets or resources or capital that the DAO controls. So the power to to execute actions or like basically use that capital or um, allocate those resources in a DAO is distributed in via some distribution among or across every single member of the DAO or every single member of the community. It doesn't necessarily have to be equally distributed. There can be people with more context that have more power and people who are newer or of lower context that have less power. But a crucial 
property of a DAO is that every single person, every single member of the community has at least some share of that power to actually execute actions. And that's, that's brand new. That's never really been possible ever before. It's kind of uniquely enabled by cryptography and, and smart contracts and, and blockchains. The other really important thing is that the information or sort of the, the, the data about the DAO's sort of crucial operations, mostly relating to the allocation of, of the DAO's resources and how that's working and, and different operations within the DAO, needs to be fully transparent, fully accessible, ungated to every member of the community and maybe even to to the world at large, potentially. Again, that is that's something that is not really possible with any other technologies outside of blockchain, smart contracts, et cetera. So those are, the I think, the two big unique properties of DAOs that enable all, all of the, this other flexibility in how you can or, uh, structure an organization. Gotcha. And then on the flip side of that, are there any common mistakes that you've seen DAOs make that have led to their demise? Demise? I'm not sure we've seen a ton of DAOs uh, <laughs> dying as of as of yet. I'm sure we'll see a lot over time, and that's nothing to be afraid of. That's very natural. I suspect that a big driver of lower degrees of success in fostering a, a really healthy community that is able to bring in ideas and implementations and create value from from everywhere in the community. I suspect that one of the things that some communities are going to struggle with is power being too concentrated within just the founders or the very early people. And that having some degree of a chilling effect on the level of engagement and the the value that can be created by people who are on the periphery or other members of the community. One of the challenges I think that we all as humans face is that it's very difficult once you have some degree of power or control to give it up, at least for us mere humans. I think there are some incredible like superheroes out there, a lot of whom are in this space right now, who are somehow able to do that and they should be applauded uh, till the end of the world. But the majority of humanity does not have those supernatural capabilities. And it's very difficult for a community that starts very concentrated to over time distribute power. And I think that might have a bit of a chilling effect on how successful those communities can be in driving engagement, driving contributions and value created from from everywhere. So are you sort of saying that organizations that start out very centralized should stay that way instead of trying to be decentralized? Or is it possible for a centralized company to become decentralized, but there are maybe certain things that they must do in the process in order to make sure it works. I think they should try if they if that's what they want to do and if they think there's value in that or their community wants that. I do think it's challenging and it needs to be something that is done with intent and and commitment. I have seen certain certain what are essentially companies like get really interested in in like launching a DAO and really what they mean is they want to launch a token so that they can sell it essentially. And that might be a good way to to exit or to sell a token. It's not a great way to build a community and build a lasting a healthy DAO. So there's there's some specific commitments that I think those those organizations need to make if they're serious about it. Going back to what you were saying about governance earlier, that kind of reminded me of this article you wrote on Mir about I think maybe it was just titled anti-capture. Can you sort of go over this anti-capture framework, this capture-resistant framework, and explain what that means and how uh, that can apply to DAOs and people listening who are part of DAOs and thinking about how to like properly structure their governance? Yeah, I, so I, I guess um, anti-capture is a framework that I have sort of kind of come to understand as as helpful for navigating this space and challenges in in this space i don't necessarily consider it a like a blueprint or something that is that should necessarily be followed by DAOs. i think it can help describe and understand some of the challenges but it basically it's actually a little bit similar to what i was was saying just before about the like the key properties of DAOs. i think those those i have sort of figured out or come to understand as key properties based on thinking more about the the anti-capture framework. And the anti-capture framework is basically 
me trying to grapple with or figure out or understand what is unique about DAOs and why haven't we seen them exist before and what can they uniquely bring to the table. And I think my hypothesis, or I guess my theory is that DAOs, or I guess decentralized governance in in a more general concept, is the most capture-resistant form of governance that has ever existed, at least governance that can can grow at, at scale. And I have this feeling or this theory that the the threat of capture of, of resources is what has resulted in so many organizations pre-DAO or traditional organizations having to take this very, very hierarchical, top-down, centralized control kind of structure. Because they want to bring a lot of people's resources together because there's so much power in doing that. And collecting capital and going to deploy it as a group is a really powerful construct, a powerful way of of doing important things. But when you put everybody's resources together, you can't just give everybody access to all of it because somebody might just take it all. Um, so you have to have some way of figuring out who has permissions or who has authority to spend or take or or manage those resources or that or that capital. And when when we're dealing with sort of the like traditional non blockchain kind of world, the only real way to do that outside of having a, like a small group of trusted friends or trusted family members, the only real way to do that is to impose this like top down hierarchical control that might be backed by a legal system uh, where you can kind of resolve disputes with this external body that has its power because of its monopoly on violence within that particular jurisdiction. But DAOs, because they use blockchains and smart contracts, enable the like conditional splitting up of the control so that everybody shares in the control over those things. And that is very resistant to capture of those things, of those resources, and allows a structure to be created or to form that is not hierarchical, that is more of a flat or sort of network-based. And I think that is that is very unique. So my perspective is that we should be leaning into that rather than trying to kind of crowbar in more traditional structures or more traditional concepts of power into the organizations that we're creating with DAOs and, and the, these new Web3 communities. So practically speaking, I, I, I'm wondering if you can give an example of like a real life um, scenario you've been in or the way that one of the many DAOs you're part of is structured in this anti with this anti-capture framework uh, of how like how governance and how power is distributed and how it plays out because I think this has been really like something I've heard a lot of people talk about lately is you know on the, on the one hand some people are like it's got to be completely decentralized but then on the other hand people are like well that's not realistic you still need to have some people with more power than others but I think it's it's all just super meta to talk about it, like theoretically. Um, so I'm wondering if you have an example you can think of, like a real life example that you could share. Yeah, so there are certainly many types of DAOs that are capture resistant and sort of fit this this concept. Uh, and as I've said before, the the design space is quite large for them. One of my favorite examples and the one type of DAO or DAO framework that I think does a great job of this is the Moloch DAO framework. Moloch DAOs are definitely have been an inspiration to me in understanding further you know, what is unique about DAOs and what DAOs can do. And what Moloch DAOs do a really great job of is, is uh, distributing power to to everybody who's involved. DAOs that are defined by by a token tend to rely on on off-chain signaling that then gets executed by a small set of of multi-sig signers, which is a, a fine model for a lot of reasons or for a lot of in a lot of um, scenarios. But it ultimately is is pretty capturable. There's just a few people. There's there's a risk that those few people don't actually follow what uh, what the snapshot off-chain signal says there's also a legal risk as well because there's just a few very easily identifiable people who could potentially be held responsible for something or be uh, shut down in some way. Um, whereas a, a Moloch DAO, while you might be able to identify the individual people, it still might be hard to identify which of them is responsible for uh, putting whatever action into action. Everybody in the 
Malik Dao is collectively involved in doing that. Everybody who is a member of the DAO has a share of the executive power in the DAO. Many of the DAOs, probably most of the DAOs that I am in or have been a part of, have been Malik DAOs. So I fully admit I'm a little bit biased in, in this, though I do think my experience in them has given me a lot of insight into what is possible uh, when you have a structure like that. Right. So I, I think Malik DAOs are one of many frameworks that can exist in a DAO. And it certainly isn't for everybody, but it definitely works really well for certain types of DAOs. What, which types of DAOs can benefit the most from the Malik DAO framework? Because we've got, you know, now in today's landscape, there seems to be a new DAO popping up every other day. And we have so many different types. We have investment DAOs. We have grants DAOs. We have like just social DAOs, just for fun DAOs, like so many different types of DAOs. What kinds do you see benefiting the most from the Malik DAO framework? So the, the Malik DAO framework is really great. It's, it's actually quite flexible, and especially with a lot of the, the tools that the that DAO House has added to the Malik DAO framework around the edges. But it's still the case that the, a Malik DAO framework is, is really great for things like grants DAOs or investment DAOs, where the members are the ones who are putting in the capital and then they are collectively controlling that. And the reason primarily is that Malik DAOs, as many people may know, or some people may know, have this concept of rage quit, where if I have a certain number of shares in the Moloch DAO, those shares represent both my voting weight, my voting power, as well as my exit rights or my economic stake in the treasury. And I can redeem my shares in order to rage quit a, a, a pro rata or fair portion of what's in the treasury. So Moloch DAOs work great if I'm the one putting my own money into the treasury along with some number of other people. And then I maintain Essentially, I maintain custody over my funds, even while they're main, made available for collective use. And so they create this, in, in that kind of way, they create this, like, what I've been thinking about as a superposition between my resources, my private resources, and shared resources. Or a, like a, this superposition of individualism, like focused just on me, as well as collectivism. Um, where at the same time, we're, we're being able, able to do those things. And that's really great for a grants DAO or an investment DAO of some sort. Gotcha. So DAOs where the treasury is kind of a big part of the overall mission of what the DAO is trying to accomplish versus, say, you know, another DAO where uh, maybe many of the members are constantly voting on proposals for other things that don't necessarily involve the treasury directly, then Moloch might not be the most used. There might be other frameworks that uh, could work better. Uh, yes, I think Moloch DAO's relative strength is stronger for the sort of treasury-centric use cases. That said, Moloch DAOs are quite flexible and actually do work quite well in, in lots of different ways. One of the things that I struggle with, and I think we're trying to get better at within DAO House, is articulating that and maybe creating some examples so people can understand how to use Moloch DAOs in those ways. They're actually quite flexible and it's very difficult to like pin down the best way to use a Moloch DAO, even if there are certain ways that they were sort of originally designed for that are, are very clearly uh, a strong use case. For sure. So I, I want to get into some of those examples just so listeners can get a better idea of um, of how they could spin up their DAO under DAO House. But take us back, provide some context on what DAO House is, how it began, and how it's evolved over time. I know I think at, at the beginning, it wasn't even called DAO House. It was called uh, something else, which the name escapes me now. And then to where you are today, you're on V3 that you just launched. It's got some new features um, talk about like that the genesis of Dow House and how it's evolved to today. Yeah. So before I even got involved, uh, Dow House was called Pokemon, which was short for Pocket Moloch. So it was basically a at, at one point it was a, a like a mobile first application, the first u user interface for being in a Moloch Dow. So seeing how many shares you have, seeing the other members in the Dow looking at, voting on, creating proposals, seeing what's in the treasury, that kind of thing. Um, and, and that grew out of a need within the, 
it was largely the Meta Cartel community, Meta Cartel being the first fork of the original Moloch DAO. And then there started to be many of those forks. And within that community of people that were using Moloch DAOs in all sorts of different ways, there arose a need to not just be doing that with code or interacting directly with Etherscan. So a few few people just in the community decided they were going to build this tool. And then they were, were kind of working on it, supporting it on the side, making some improvements. After a while, it became clearer that there was a real need you know, in a, like a larger way for like a, a real stable product that could facilitate both using of Moloch DAOs as well as creating or launching or what we call summoning Moloch DAOs. So that's where DAO House was born. I think it was in, uh, technically it was in East Berlin in 2019. Maybe like a year later or six months later or something, the original project team that which had just been really working on the side decided that decided that they wanted to make it into a real product. And so they started collecting a few other contributors. And that's where I sort of started to, to help out. And the, the result of that initial effort was the seeds of what is the, what we call Dow House V2. So today, if you go to the Dow House app, Dow House V2 is what you'll see. And it's kind of almost like an all-in-one Dow platform. So there's a way to launch or, again, summon a, a Moloch Dow uh, with various options. There's a way to look at all the members, look at your own shares, the, the treasury, make different types of proposals, uh, vote on proposals, rage quit if you so are interested. Uh, also look at all the other DAOs that have been launched on, on DAO House and they sort of explore them. All of that kind of packaged into one, uh, plus some add-ons and plugins that we call boosts, where you can, for example, um, create a proposal uh, it, we, it's a disperse proposal using the disperse app to distribute funds to a, a, a large number of, of recipients or discord notifications or all these other add-ons. So that's DAO House V2, where things have changed a lot in the DAO ecosystem <laughs> over the last like six to 12 months. There's been an explosion in all of these amazing horizontal DAO tools and these more of this, this uh, concept of composability and interoperability and not being this big monolithic kind of application. So in Dow House V3, which we're working on right now, we're actually tearing everything down and building it all back up based on much more modular individual components and creating applications that are more focused on specific, uh, specific use cases. So no longer is the summoning application going to be linked up together with the explore or the switching between DAOs kind of, kind of application. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to make sure that all the DAOs that are on DAO House have access to as many DAO tools as they might want to use. Every DAO is different. They have different needs, different problems to solve. And so we want to make sure that it's easy as possible for them to access and kind of use or incorporate into their DAO all of these other, other tools like Coordinate or maybe Utopia or, or Govern or whatever it is. And so we want to make it much easier for those projects to build integrations or compose with DAO House. Um, so we're going in this totally opposite direction of trying to make it as easy as possible for anybody to, to build or integrate with or compose the DAO House infrastructure. Uh, so we see DAO House less as like this big monolithic app and more as something that everybody in the ecosystem can plug into and use almost as, as like a governance layer for what they're doing. I love that. And speaking of all of these DAO tools, what are some of the most powerful DAO tools in the space that exist today, in your view? And um, are, are there any DAO tools that are missing that you would love to see built out uh, in the near future? Yeah, there. I think there's more missing than than exists so far. We're we're getting there, but they're like we're as we're going, we're just learning so much about. We collectively, all of us, are learning so much about the different types of of challenges and problems. And how to think about them in a totally different mindset than this top-down hierarchical kind of approach that society is is so used to. Um, I think some of the most impactful or powerful DAO tools are the ones that are explicitly bottom-up. Uh, Coordinate is an excellent example of this, where instead of a few people being sort of elected to determine compensation for people, for others. 
compensation or sort of even like performance evaluation can happen in a peer-to-peer, intersubjective, bottom-up kind of way. And I think there's work to do to figure out all of the different parameters to use and exactly how to do it. But I think that's a really valuable and, and powerful model that I, I think lots of other DAO tools are going to follow. I think we can do sort of prioritization setting and attention management and sort of individual commitment to different work streams in a similar kind of way where you're like allocating some scarce resource, whether it's coordinate give tokens or some individual like capacity points or your your assessment of how important a particular project is. I think and I think that might eventually all come together as this like cohesive mesh of of attention setting and allocation and and evaluation that is like simultaneously bottom up but also results in this aggregate kind of kind of thing. That's a space I'm I'm watching pretty closely. Very interesting. Maybe somebody will build it during the bear market now that it's quiet and <laughs> yeah. people can be heads down and build. Um, okay, so I want to get back to the examples of uh, DAOs that you can build under DAO House. Uh, can you give some examples and maybe highlight some of the main features of DAO House? And it can be real examples of real DAOs that are spun out under DAO House, or it could you can make up your own fake DAOs um, that you could see working out under DAO House, whatever's easier. Yeah, so I can give a few examples and maybe try to come up with some new ones. So the the very first DAO in in our space, other than the original Moloch DAO, is is Meta Cartel, and that's a great example. Meta Cartel is a grants DAO, and the members have basically pooled their funds into the treasury of a Moloch DAO, and then every every couple of weeks or every month they make decisions about grants to give to other project projects in the space. So it, it's been become a really great way to, as I was saying earlier, put your money into a into a common pool, but maintain control over it, such that you're able to take some risks with other people, and you know, try new things and form these really strong bonds uh, that has become the basis of this really rich and productive community that is Meta Cartel. Uh, the another one is Meta Cartel Ventures, which is an investment DAO, basically a venture DAO. And it's a, a kind of a similar model where you put your money into the pool and then that money, instead of going to grants, goes to investments. And then the, the result of those investments comes back into the common pool, back into the treasury. And then based on the economic stake that you have that your shares give you, you now control or, or really own that portion of the treasury. Another type of, of DAO that exists on DAO House is a service DAO. There's, there's a, a few of these. Uh, Plaza is one. Um, YapDAO is one. Uh, Raid Guild is is probably the first, and all of those have a roughly similar concept where they do work for clients, and they might have little. And in Raid Guild, they're called raids, where there's a raid party, a few a few raiders, few members of of the DAO. They a client comes in and says, "Hey, I want to do such and such." And then those people will kind of organize around doing such and such, whether that's building a, a website, a smart contract, doing some, some communications or marketing kind of work. And then the, the client will pay them. 90% will go to them and 10% will go into the shared treasury. And then that shared treasury can be used for internal improvement projects or uh, things to help uh, the productivity of everybody the kind of kind of thing, and everybody's basically a partner in this in this cooperative. Another model is a well, is, is DAO House itself is a is a product DAO, and there's a few others as well. And the way that typically works is instead of most of the funds living in the treasury, um, so DAO House has done some fundraising before, and most of the funds that we've raised from our community in different forms sit in a side vault, and or multiple vaults. And those vaults are not rage quittable, which means that money, those funds are not the members' funds. They are the DAO's funds collectively. Uh, and so those funds can be spent on, on, on development, on expenses, on uh, maybe some marketing, uh, sponsoring a hackathon kind of thing. But those funds can still be managed by the, by the Moloch DAO, by the DAO House DAO, with the same sort of share-based, share-based voting. In, in DAO House, the way this works is 
shares are actually determined by the number of house tokens, which is the DAO house token, the number of house tokens that you have essentially staked into the treasury. So those shares are, are almost like backed by, by house tokens. So I have some house tokens. I have staked some of them into the treasury and I've received shares in accordance with that. I can rage quit them if I want at some point and I would lose my, my voting power, but I would get my house tokens back. Or I could keep them in there and use the associated shares to help guide the direction of, of certain things that we're doing at Dow House. I really like those examples. Um, I, I I really like the feature of being able to stake your tokens, your native tokens back into the DAO um, to get more governance. I, I think that model, that's like probably one of my favorite things that stands out to me personally about the uh, the DAO house, like what you're able to do on DAO house. Um, here's a creative exercise. If you were to start a burrito DAO <laughs> and launch it under summon it under DAO house, what would that look like? Are you are you thinking like a burrito appreciation DAO or a burrito production DAO or is it? It can be anything you okay. want. So I think one of the coolest things about DAOs is that they are actually quite flexible. They can start as one thing and like totally turn into another. So I think I would start it as a burrito appreciation DAO. So almost like a like a social club in a sense, where in a similar way as a, as a grants DAO, the people that wanted to join could put a little bit of funding to help host events or or pay for everybody's burritos or something like that. Put a little bit of money into the treasury, get shares back, and then maybe every month or every week or two weeks or every day, if you're really excited about burritos, everybody could almost like a book club, like go get a burrito, eat it, talk about it. Even even just on Discord or something it doesn't even have to be IRL. And then, uh, as more people join, the treasury might might grow a little bit. And then at some point, maybe, and this is where it gets super speculative, but maybe, maybe some of the people in the DAO decide that they want to actually start a a taqueria, start a a, a burrito place. So maybe they decide that they want to raise some some funds from the the members or maybe other people uh, that they know. And so what they could do is actually create another DAO. The original DAO, the appreciation DAO could get shares in that new DAO. So it kind of has a stake in in what's going on. And then the the new DAO could could raise some funds and they could do that. Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. DAO House makes a few different ways available. One is sort of like NFT sale kind of thing that we call DAO Grony. Another is a just direct contribution directly into the DAO that we call a, a yeeter. But the, all of those are ways for people to contribute funds into that DAO and get shares back directly. So they maintain custody of what they put in up to the point where they decide that they want to allow it to be spent to, say, start a start a taqueria or on expenses for the taqueria. I don't know. That I could know, go that I could go pretty that. crazy, but there's <laughs> sounds pretty fun. Yeah, that started out as like a social DAO and turned into kind of like almost like a cabin DAO or like a Krauss house model yeah, yeah, yeah. of turning it into a physical space or buy, maybe buying your favorite burrito shop in San Francisco um, and, you know, having it be owned and managed by the DAO. I don't know if that would actually be good for the business. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Maybe maybe in a, a few years when we figure some things out in DAO. Yeah. 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 Um, so looking ahead to the future, where do you see DAOs fitting into the rest of not just the Web3 ecosystem, but also just into people's day-to-day -day lives in, let's say, the next three to five years? I think they're going to be increasingly part of people's day-to-day -day lives. It, it's very difficult to say exactly when that'll really, like the inflection point will really happen. But I, I think that at, we might reach a point where a substantial number of new what would have been companies get formed as DAOs rather than companies to start. I don't really anticipate a lot of existing companies converting into DAOs for some of the reasons, like it's very difficult to, to give up power and kind of totally change the structure of your organization. But I, I do expect as DAOs start to get better and sort of prove out the model and demonstrate to the world that there are incredible things that you can do when you when you structure the the power and and the the way you organize that way, I think more and more people are gonna gonna start to play around, 
And we're going to reach a point where that starts to really accelerate. And that'll be a really cool moment. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that moment myself. And uh, on the flip side of that, if DAOs completely cease to exist in the next three to five years, which I don't believe this at all, this is purely a hypothetical, but say, just entertain the hypothetical, say DAOs no longer are in existence in five years, why would that be? Whew. I think there's a, a bunch of a bunch of reasons that that could happen. Like you, I don't think any of them are particularly likely to be fatal to DAOs. But one that I'm sure everybody has in their mind is you know, regulatory kind of circumstances. There could be something, some kind of regulation or law that gets passed that like makes it just so risky to be in a DAO that nobody feels comfortable doing so. I think there there could be other reasons like we start to go too far towards uh, having these like pretty concentrated power structures that we start to call DAOs, and that becomes normalized. And then at what we end up at the end of the day with is basically just companies. It could be that we, we try to go too far too fast in the direction of permissionlessness and try to like deal all at once with the noise that comes from having everybody in the world able to to have have input into into what's going on, I think sushi struggled with this. For example, uh, if we have more examples of that, or we don't learn lessons from that, I think I think DAOs could be in in trouble there. Well, well, after that uh, that kind of down note, um, I like to end every podcast episode on more of a fun, lighthearted note. And uh, for that, that for me, that means a quick little game. And so what we're playing this season is called This or That. It's where I give you two words, A or B, and you tell me which one you prefer. You don't have to explain anything. It's just going to be a really quick lightning round, and I've got 10 pairs of words for you. You Let's ready to go? Okay. First one, Bitcoin or Ethereum? Ethereum. Crypto or Web3? Web3. DeFi or DAOs? DAOs. Bear market or bull market? Mm, bull market. Building or investing? Building. Books or podcasts? Mm, books. <laughs> Burritos or puns? Oh, damn. I read your Twitter bio. Yeah. <laughs> Burritos. Okay. Chicago or San Francisco? <sighs> Chicago. Beach or mountains? Mountains. And then last one, past or future? Future. Awesome. You you did great. I just those were those were tough, some of them. <laughs> I recorded an episode um that I think is actually gonna air after this with uh Catherine Wu. I don't know if you know her, but uh -huh. she couldn't really make it past the first one. I said Bitcoin or Ethereum, and she was about to lose it. So you did a fantastic <laughs> job. You passed with flying colors. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, last thing, Spencer, before you go, tell people where they can find you if they want to follow you personally, and then also where people can go to learn more about Dow House or any of the other projects you're working on. Yeah, um, I guess so. I'll, best place to find me is is on Twitter. It's pretty much exclusively the best place. Spengra is my handle there. Then for Dow House, the best place to start is the Dow House homepage, which is DowHouse.club. Uh, there's links from there to a bunch of different places. Uh, the app itself, which is great to explore, lots of documentation and other resources about Moloch DAOs and 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 a lot of things that we've learned over the years. And then also our our Discord server, which is a great place to hop in and and get started. Uh, one of the things that we like to do the most, or that we actually do quite a lot of, is helping communities form DAOs and think through all of the nuances of, of starting a DAO. It can be very simple if you just want to get started, but it also can be quite challenging. And uh, there's a lot of considerations to, to work through. So we're very happy and excited about helping other communities and, and DAOs do that. And the best place to, to get started there is, is Discord. Uh, one other thing I'm working on is, uh, I'll just quickly plug, is called Hats Protocol. Uh, it's a, a new new concept for almost like decentralized DAO native uh, permissions management or credentialing or delegation of authority. Um, 
pretty excited about uh, about that and how it kind of meshes together with uh, some of the other things I've been working on. We'll have to bring you on again in the future to talk more about that. Yeah. I, I've seen Hats Protocol around tw the Twitterverse, but kind of just assumed it had something to do with Hats. And this is actually the first time I've heard it explained and it has nothing to do with Hats. So It has. <laughs> hats are roles. People wear many hats uh, uh, within organizations. So that's the, that's the idea. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, cool. Well, we will include all of those links in the show notes to make it easy for people to find. Thank you, Spencer, so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll be back again soon with another episode of Rehash. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Rehash, a Web3 podcast. The guest from this episode, Spencer Graham, was nominated by JP and voted onto the podcast by Tim, Zach, Triumph, Tyler Internet, and Diana Chen. Some of the questions you heard were submitted by Karsten. Rehash is hosted by Diana Chen, produced and edited by Ellie Dots and Tyler Internet, and as always, supported by RehashDAO. To stay up to date on all things Rehash, you can follow us on Twitter at RehashWeb3 and join our Discord to get involved.